Good afternoon, Dolphins fans. Welcome to another episode here of On the Fin Side with Kat and Paul. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, all of our social media outlets, as well as the fan sided network and finfanatic.com. We have the 49ers and Dolphins this weekend played in San Francisco. We are joined here by Oscar Aparicio, formerly of the Better Rivals podcast. Uh, he's been our 49ers correspondent here and uh, has helped us with any 49ers insight here. Uh, we probably remember him from about four years ago. Oscar, how you doing today and uh, what's going on there? Doing really well. Looking at pictures of Mike McDaniel longingly. Uh, I see all the funny videos of him telling Justin Fields to stop sneaking it or to stop scrambling as a quarterback, just whispering lovingly that Georgia is the best SEC team and to a tongue of Iloa's ear. Uh, and I miss him. I miss him. Uh, my cousin told me that he was the Neil Brennan of the NFL. I can't say that I disagree. Yeah. I can't <laughs> see it now. Very cool. What is, uh, I how has the 49ers offense changed this year without Mike McDaniel, if at all? So it, that, that's really hard for me to say because, you know, I don't know what, what runs they've installed or what each individual coach kind of contributed. Um, I mean, the, the, the Niners run game is still really varied. You're still going to see a lot of really fun run concepts and, and they're going to throw a lot at teams. The, the Niners are known as that wide zone, outside zone team, and that is still their base run. But their most effective runs for a few years now have been powers and counters. Um, and that's, I, I don't think, a, a mistake. I think you, you look at what the team has tried to do, especially knowing that Trey Lance is going to take over. And I know that hasn't happened because of his ankle exploding. But the that is the type of power run scheme that Lance uh, executed really well when he was in college, his power counter. Um, and you get to a lot of those powers and counters in fun and unique ways. And I think a lot of that started under Mike McDaniel uh, and that has continued under Shanahan. And so I don't know that schematically it's really any different, um, but I, I still think you still have those threads and those elements of just a really creative run game. Um, I wonder if Mike McDaniel were in charge of the passing game in San Francisco, if we would see more of what you would see in, in Miami. But, um, but yeah, I, I don't know that it's been appreciably different. Gotcha. Yeah. And I've watched a few of the Niners games. I didn't see anything that was completely different, even though obviously here in Miami, the Dolphins fans and myself are, are happy with the job McDaniel's done so far. Dolphins are eight and three. They've won five in a row. 49ers are seven and four. They've won four in a row and have not allowed a second half point in four games in a row and haven't allowed a point on defense um, for the last six quarters. So looking at that, Oscar, I mean, everybody knows Nick, who Nick Bosa is, 11 and a half sacks on the year, third according to PFF and pressures. The rest of the defense, I mean, not a whole heck of a lot of household names uh, besides uh, Bosa and Fred Warner. What do you attribute the success of this defense to besides those two guys? It, it's really two things. One is going to be an upgrade at one key position, and that's going to be cornerback. Charverius Ward, who likes to be known as Mooney Ward, he goes by his nickname, Mooney, uh, and I as a Harry Potter fan will oblige. Uh, Mooney likes, uh, he, he really upgraded that corner spot and solidified it on the outside. He is someone that now allows the 49ers to play a bit more man coverage, which leads into what the second thing is, and that's just D'Amico Ryans. D'Amico Ryans is someone who is, he is more aggressive and I think a little bit more creative in what he does in high leverage situations than previous defensive coordinators. Robert Sala, fantastic defensive coordinator, not taking that away from him. And the Jets have a pretty good defense this year. They've got some really good talent there too. Um, but what, what Ryans has done is especially in, on third down is he will have lots of creative blitzes. He'll bring his linebackers up to into the A gaps and kind of that like Zimmer mug look. Um, and, and he likes to do that when it counts. Like he's like, it's third and long. Yes. I know I have Nick Bosa. Yes. I know I, I might have Charles Amenahu and who's had played really, really well, but, but I'm, I'm going to blitz. I'm going to make you beat me. Um, if not, we're going to hit you. And, and I feel like that's how an old linebacker is going to call defense. But I think those two things have really been drivers to what the 49ers have been able to do on, on defense. Yeah, well, what they're doing is working. I mean, fewest points in the league, 15.7 points per game allowed. Fewest yards per game at right around 282 allowed. Um, it's certainly working. And one thing that the Dolphins, I think, are going to see here offensively is that, you know, over the last two weeks against the Texans and Browns, they've faced primarily zone coverage. 
the 49ers are able to toggle back and forth between zone, between man. And they're, if they don't get to the pressure, get to the quarterback with Bosa, they're going to be able to blitz the quarterback too. But yeah, Charvarius Ward signed from the Chiefs, a former Sam Madison protege there with the Chiefs. Um, yeah, playing fantastic football. Uh, other than Ward, um, tell me a little bit more about your about your secondary because I know a lot of these guys, uh, you know, weren't starting for the 49ers here two or three years ago. Yeah, I, I think the place where you're going to have a, a little bit of concern is on the other side of Charvarius Ward because we did have Emmanuel Mosley lost him to a knee injury, and so now you're looking at you know your third, fourth corner in that area, and and right now that's Diamador Lenore. He's playing at that other outside spot and he's had an up and down career. I think he's in his second year, but he is one of those players that has potential, but can get a little grabby, um, is a little untested. And, and so if you're looking at, you know, two wide receivers like Waddle and, and, and Tyree kill, they're probably going to, if I were the dolphins, I would absolutely target Diamond or Lenore or, you know, I mean, they, they do most of their damage in the slot. I think Tyree kill is the top graded wide receiver in the slot from PFF so far this season. And, and that's where you get to Jimmy Ward. Jimmy Ward is playing in the slot because Deshaun Gibson is playing well at safety. He and Talano Hufanga are the starting safeties. You've got Jimmy Ward who moved from free safety, or, which is really his best position. And now he's playing in the slot. I don't know that Jimmy Ward has the speed to keep up with Tyree Kill in the slot. So I think if anything, you're probably going to see some bracket coverage when you see him in the slot, maybe some, some, you know, like some cone coverage to really try to manage that because you're going to have to figure out something in the slot. Um, that means you've got other areas that, you know, you can begin to exploit at that point if you've got the time to do it. Um, but that's the secondary for the 49ers. It's, it's Gibson, it's Talano Hufanga, who's having a, a wonderful year as a second year. He's a fifth round pick out of USC. Uh, the Niners love him. I, I, ca I call him a high, uh, he has like a, he plays at a high frequency. He's just always vibrating all the time. Um, and when he gets into the line of scrimmage, he's going to time the snap and he's going to hit your running back if it's a run, or he's going to hit your quarterback if it's a pass. Um, and he's a, he's a fun guy to watch. Um, even if he, he does really need to play down the hill, he's not really going to like cover a lot of things behind him. Um, and yeah. so that, that's, that's the secondary for the Niners. Well, thank you for pronouncing those names uh, for us as well. Hufanga <laughs> and Lenore. Um, and I remember, you know, cause we, we look at the draft a lot here uh, in, you know, January through April here. And when Hufanga came out of USC, I, I watched him a few times and I said, no, nah, I think he's a little bit too slow to play the position, but what I underestimate is the football IQ that he brings. And he certainly brought that to the Niners back in there four interceptions a forced fumble and a sack on the year um and pairing with jimmy ward a really good good combo but like you said ward is going to be moving up and playing in the nickel and that's going to bring up a fascinating matchup with whether it's tyree kill whether it's former 49er trent sherfield who's come on here in recent weeks too so yeah a lot, a lot of interesting matchups there um fred warner and dre greenlaw from what I've observed, really don't ever leave the field. You've got those two guys there pretty much every down, correct? Yeah, that's about right. That even though, you know, the base defense versus non-base defense is an interesting term in, in today's NFL. I think you've got the defenses that you play on base downs versus the defense that you play most of the time. Most defenses nowadays play nickel most of the time. So you've got two linebackers uh, and, and a nickel corner. And, and those two linebackers are Dre Greenlaw and Fred Warner. Fred Warner um, plays the middle of the field and plays those seams and crossing routes um, better than anyone in the NFL. You, you look at someone like Kirk Cousins who thrives in Shanahan style offenses. And one of the things that made Shanahan style offenses so good was that they beat cover three defenses by spamming those crossers. I mean, over and over and over again, you get the crosser against cover three, it's going to be wide open. And Kirk Cousins makes his money on this route. And that's the route that, um, that's, that's the route specifically that Fred Warner takes away. I mean, he is in such good a position in coverage, it's wild. And Dre Greenlaw, on the other hand, is that like anything in the curl flat, he's going to fire. He's going to go super fast, sometimes too aggressively, sometimes a little after the whistle. Uh, and he's gotten penalized a little bit uh, uh, this, this so far this season. But I do think that they are two good linebackers, speedy linebackers, um, and, and a really good coverage linebacker in, in Fred Warner. And that's going to be one of the fascinating things to watch with Tua because, you know, I, I, it'd be easy to think that Tyree Kill and Jalen Waddle, they're just going deep every play. 
not the case. Uh, they have a lot of those routes over the middle, and there haven't been many linebackers over the last few weeks to cut those off over the last few weeks that the Dolphins have faced. So now they, they've got Fred Warner, and so you've got the Niners are good at cornerback. The Niners have the coverage linebacker, so it'll be fascinating to watch that. Uh, on the other side of the ball here, Jimmy Garoppolo doing Jimmy Garoppolo things this year, 16 touchdowns, four interceptions last week, you know, nothing special, but was a great caretaker um, there in a 13, nothing 49ers win over the saints. Um, Christian McCaffrey, as of the time we're recording this podcast, which is Thursday afternoon um, is a little bit, my understanding is iffy for this game. Um, Elijah Mitchell's out six to eight weeks. Um, if McCaffrey doesn't play, do you see them going with Jordan Mason at running back, or do you see a lot more Debo Samuel rotating in there? I think you'll get more Debo, more Debo Samuel runs for some of the creative, we need explosive type runs. But I do think the player that you're going to see more of is, um, is Ty Davis Price. Um, he's the running back out of LSU. He doesn't play and hasn't played because the Niners value what Jordan Mason does on special teams. But I think when you when you see when they played, uh, Ty Davis Price has actually gotten more running back snaps. So I think both of them are, are capable. They're obviously not going to be as good as Christian McCaffrey, especially in the passing game. But they will bring more along the lines of that kind of quick hit the hole, maybe need to grind out a game type of skill that Jordan Mason brought at the end of the Saints game because I mean, we had the ball with I think maybe four and a half minutes left um, and it was like I think five first downs to to really ice that game out entirely and it was and it was Mason who was able to do it and pick up some tough yards on the ground so I do think they're capable running backs but trust me it's going to be a lot better if Christian McCaffrey can play for the 49ers absolutely uh, Debo Samuel last year 1770 total yards rushing and receiving um, not putting up quite the same numbers this year, but, you know, still on pace for 1,100 yards. Um, what do you attribute that to? Is it more just miles to feed on offense or has the league more adjusted to Debo? I think it is probably a bit more mouths to feed. I, I think two things have happened with Jimmy Garoppolo specifically. I think he has gotten uh, really comfortable checking down to Christian McCaffrey, and that makes sense. Christian McCaffrey takes a three, four yard check down and turns it into a first down. I mean, the, the, the amount of yards after the catch that he can get with just quick cuts after catching an underneath dump off is, is ridiculous. He's amassing first rates at a higher rate than he did in Carolina. And he was already leading the league in first downs when he was at Carolina. So Jimmy Garoppolo, I think has a really good security blanket in Christian McCaffrey. And he's been using that tremendously. But I think the other thing, too, is you've got a little bit of a hamstring issue, which he's kind of battling with. And that meant that Brandon Ayuk was someone who was capturing more of those intermediate dig routes or those glance routes that Debo Samuel used to get. And, and I think before Christian McCaffrey, you saw Brandon Ayuk take a little bit of a leap forward. And he was averaging about 80 yards a game, which meant that now you kind of run into the mouths to be an issue, right? But you run into just kind of a different target share where it's I'm targeting that middle of the field with Ayuk. I've got my check down with Christian McCaffrey. And then Debo Samuel kind of fits in there when you need him or, or around those things. But that's what this is the offense that Shanahan wants to build. You don't know who's going to get the ball. You don't know when they're going to get it. You don't even know if we're going to run or pass based on the personnel that we've got out here. So prepare for everything and we'll let you know when we're in the end zone. Yeah. And four great weapons there, Debo, IU, Christian McCaffrey, George Kittle. Uh, when those four are on the field, I mean, that's all, all four guys that can be one-on-one -on -one coverage and have been very successful here in this league. IU leads the team with six touchdown catches. Uh, McCaffrey has six overall touchdowns between the 49ers and the Panthers. Um, moving to the offensive line, uh, Trent Williams has been one of the best in the game, if not the best offensive tackle. And you got Mike McGlinchey on the other side. This will be a fascinating matchup because the Dolphins traded for Bradley Chubb a few weeks ago. They've got Jalen Phillips having a great season on the other side. And the Dolphins, from those edge spots, even though they face good offensive tackles, have been able to provide a lot of pressure. Um, Tell me a little bit more about your offensive line here, uh, kind of where the strengths and the weaknesses are as we head into this game. Yeah, I think if you asked any any 49ers fan what they were most worried about this offseason, it would have been the offensive line. And and I think that's because you had a second-year unproven player starting at left guard in Aaron Banks, 
and and myself and other people were not too high on him, especially considering he couldn't beat out. Um, really, he couldn't see the field uh, at all his rookie year. And, and so you begin to worry about that player, but he's actually rounded out into a, a decent a, a starting caliber guard, which is good. I, I don't think he's going to be making any all pro, all pro lists or, or pro bowl lists this season for sure, but he is not a liability, which is fantastic. You look at your center uh, and Jake Brendel, and he's also had a really solid year. He's a great find. I think once you start getting to the right guard spot, that's been a, really a problem spot for the 49ers really since Shanahan's been around. He's always tried to fill that with like a, he's like a cut rate player. Um, and whether it be someone that you sign, you know, kind of on the cheap or someone like Daniel Brunskill or right now rookie guard, Daniel uh, Burford, I think that's where the weakness begins to, to really show. And then you get to right tackle um, and you get to Mike McGlinchey, who I think is, is a fine tackle, but he does struggle against really powerful bull rush type tackles. Um, and, and that's problematic um, because there's a lot of really good tackles out there. Um, one of his worst games was against Chris Jones when they moved Chris Jones against chiefs mm -hmm. out to defensive end and just, he couldn't handle the power and he kept getting walked back into um, into the lap of, of Jimmy Garoppolo. So I think, you know, you've got, in my opinion, the best offensive lineman in the NFL and Trent Williams on one side and, and banks is a good combination to him. Most of our runs are going to be successful over the left-hand side. Center is also going to sure. be good. It's the right side of the offensive line that starts to get a little shaky sometimes. I see. I see. And if that's the case, the dolphins would be wise to put Melvin Ingram and Bradley Chubb over there a little bit more power than maybe J Jalen Phillips is. Who's a kind of a backside pursuer edge player. So yeah. And that defensive tackle, Zach Sealer, Christian Wilkins, Raquan Davis have been very good against the run this year. Um, I'm excited to I'm excited for Jake Brendel because here on this show, he was one of our favorites here when he was with Miami. And it was so frustrating because they even as bad as the Dolphins were at that time from about 2016 to 2018 on the interior, they never got Jake Brendel on the field. And I never understood why. So it's good to see him as a center starting center here in the NFL a few years later. Um, so Oscar, looking at this game, there are a lot of storylines. Mike McDaniel, uh, and my Shanahan going back uh, against each other. You've got the Niners who have won four in a row. You've got the Dolphins who have won five. You've got the Dolphins as the second best defense in the NFL. The Niners as statistically the best defense in the NFL. What kind of storylines are, are you most excited for in this game here? Man, you know, I do think it will be interesting to see if Shanahan continues his success against his former protégés. I mean, you think of Sean McVay, the Niners absolutely own the Rams um, and have for some time. The only game they've lost was perhaps the one that mattered. It was the NFC Championship game uh, this past season. But they are, I think, 7-0 seven, uh, seven and oh against them in the, the regular season thus far, you've got the Niners consistently beating the Packers uh, and Mike LaFleur. They haven't played the Jets yet, I don't believe, so we don't have a, a Robert Sala game. But Shanahan is pretty good at beating the guys that he's brought up over the years. But Mike McDaniel is, I think, his longest tenured uh, right-hand man. They were together even before McVeigh and LaFleur were. were it, it's because when he you know had his... his unfortunate event that he had and he was fired from Houston that he had to go away to the USFL for a couple of years, Mike McDaniel, that McVeigh and LaFleur came in to the picture with Shanahan. So McDaniel has a longer relationship. He probably knows Shanahan's offense the most out of anyone, really, to the, a, a deep visceral level. And so I'm curious if he continues to have that success against his his former protege. Um, Certainly. I will tell you, there is, uh, there is a cadre of fans, myself included, who look at just the absolute fun that he is having in Miami. Um, and, and like, I'm a little jealous. Yeah. Like, I, like he is having fun. He's he, it seems like he's the kind of coach that like knows that this is a high stakes event, but also knows that it's a game and doesn't take it too seriously and keeps everyone loose and keeps everyone fun. And the kind of way that you need to, to do this for 19, 20 weeks and end up on top. Right. Yeah. Um, so who absolutely. knows if that'll be sustained? Who knows? Um, who knows if, if our defense is as good as they say they are, I think they probably are, but it's always, it's tough to go up against really good offenses. And I think it'll be a really, really fun matchup, especially because I think y'all's defense is not super great. Uh, and so it, you know, it could be a high scoring affair with a lot of points and that's really exciting. And you know what, that's fun football for me. It's, it certainly is. And yeah, the dolphins 
have been a little bit better over the last few weeks, partially because of the opponents they face, the Bears, the Texans, the Browns. Uh, the pass rush has been a lot better after the addition of, of Bradley Chubb, but not a, overall the defense has not been as good as the last two years, largely because no Byron Jones, no Brandon Jones, no Nick Needham. They're without three of their top five defensive backs, and that's that's had an impact. They've, they're starting to get their feet underneath them, but that's why this is going to be a good test on the road uh, against this 49ers offense. So, Oscar, what is your score prediction for this game, Dolphins versus 49ers? Man, I don't know if both teams get into the 30s, but I think if a team gets into the 30s, um, that team probably wins. But I think it's going to be relatively high scoring. So let me go ahead and say 33-28. Uh, uh, and, uh, and I think Miami takes it out. Uh, I do think Miami wins the game just because I, I, I do think that there is, there is so much offensive weaponry and Tua does such a good job getting the ball out quick that, you know, the, the worry for Tua and the worry for the Dolphins is that the pass rush is going to get there. And your offensive line is injured. Um, you, I mean, you're, you've got a tackle playing with maybe like one pectoral muscle. Um, so like that's, that's going to be tough, uh, especially if Nick Bosa, um, who is, who's got some grown man strength decides to, to hit that pack real hard. You, um, you bet. So and Teron Armstead, I mean, uh, was supposed to be out. We, we feared for the year and then it was two or three weeks. Now he might play in this game, but like you said, he's going to be playing hurt and Austin Jackson, who I, I don't think is startable anyway is going to be out as well. But yeah, you're talking about possibly Greg little at left tackle and Brandon shell at right tackle. Um, Greg little against Nick Bosa for four quarters. If Armstead can't make it is pretty terrifying. And yeah, that's, that's going to be one to watch out for. So, uh, did, yeah, did you see Matt rule. Matt rule was recently on, uh, he was on some talk show and he was saying that they had a subset of plays that they could only run when Nick Bosa was not on the field. Oh, so man. they had, they had, they had, they had a Nick Bosa spotter and they were like, Oh, Bosa's not on the field. Okay. Let me go to that part of the call sheet and run these plays because they could not run those plays if Nick Bosa was on the field. And that's, I mean, that's kind of the, the game changer that he is. And so that I think that that's going to be an interesting matchup to watch, but Tua, I mean, he's got, I think the sixth fastest average time to throw in the NFL, Jimmy Garoppolo is eighth. Um, but his is at like 2.53 seconds. And, and he's, his average depth of target on those throws is still like seven yards downfield. So yeah, he's throwing quick, but he's still throwing deep. Um, and, and he can yeah. make you pay even when he throws quick. And I think if he can neutralize the rush by how quick he throws the ball, um, it's going to be, it's going to be hard for the Niners defense. Yeah, and a big reason for that is uh, Hill and Waddle, they get so quickly into those routes uh, so yep. that even if it's a quick release, they're still 10, 15 yards downfield when other receivers would be seven or eight yards downfield. Um, and I'm also fascinated in this game, in addition to what you said there, that between Tua and Garoppolo, you've got two of the best quarterbacks in the league against the Blitz. So these are two defensive coordinators and D'Amico Ryan's for the Niners and Josh Boyer for the Dolphins that like the blitz a lot. But if they do that, it could probably go against what's what's best for the team. Yeah, and, and the thing with Ryan's is that I don't know that he necessarily likes to blitz a lot. He likes to blitz in key situations. He likes to blitz on third down. He likes to blitz in high leverage situations. He likes to blitz where, where it really is going to kill a drive to get to the quarterback. Um, but he also likes to bluff a lot of those blitzes too. What the Niners don't do a lot of is simulated pressures. They run those in really interesting uh, scenarios and they, they only ran, I think two or three all season last year, but they ran two of them against uh, green Bay and, and they ran them in that divisional playoff game. So it, this is why I say that. I wonder if, if Shanahan's going to be like, look, I, I can lose the game, but I'm not going to lose to you. And maybe he pulls out more stops against McDaniel because he knows that like, this is, you know, it's like, Hey, like I'm, I'm, I'm the guy, you know, like I'm going to go ahead and win this game. I think that's, it's going to be interesting. Yeah. It's a big game for both teams. That's for sure. And I'm going to go, I've been going back and forth on, on my prediction. Dolphins or 49ers The 49ers are favored by four points as, of, as of the time we're recording this, I'm going to go, I'm going to go a little lower scoring. I'm going to say 21, 20 Dolphins. Um, yeah, I think it would be the first time in four games that anyone's held the dolphins below 30 points. I think if anybody's able to do that, it's going to be the 49ers. Cause I'm just endlessly impressed on what, by what they're doing here on defense. 
Yeah, I think that's that's an interesting call. I, I think if the Niners can hold the Dolphins to 21 points, I think the Niners win the game. That's that's fair to say. And we'll leave it on that note. But before we do, Oscar, um, tell us where we can find you these days. Man, so I, I wound down the podcast last season because I have I don't know if you can hear her screaming in the background, but I got a two year old now. Um, and, uh, and so she's running around and, and we needed to spend more time with the family, but I still bounce around Twitter every now and again. Um, I still got some old ski month videos that really kind of just, they're more evergreen videos to learn how to identify what coverages defenses are in and, and stuff like that. And that's on YouTube. If you search better rivals on YouTube, you can find it. Uh, you know, you can always shoot me a message on Twitter. Uh, you know, I'm always open for the, the loving McDaniel messages, uh, you know, any kind of fun, uh, jokes or press conferences that he throws I'm here for him I share them to all my buddies uh because I think uh, McDaniel's hilarious and I you know I'm glad he's in the AFC so that he can succeed from afar uh and most of the time the only time we have to worry about him is when uh we play in the Super Bowl you know when I saw McDaniel's first press conference here in Miami and I, I saw some old clips from him with the 49ers I thought all right the guy's clever he's obviously a smart guy but uh, I I really worry about what's going to happen when he has a couple of these tough press conferences. I don't know if he's going to be up for it. I'm happy to say as a Dolphins fan, I've never been more wrong about anything in my life. He has answered every single one of those calls, the whole Tua situation before not one word was out of place. And yeah, so it's, it's great to have a coach finally, who's not only smart on the sidelines, but also smart in these press conferences too. We've been, we've been waiting a long time for that. Uh, but Oscar, thanks again for joining us. And this is going to do it here for our breakdown of the Dolphins 49ers matchup. I'm Brian Cat NFL. Paul is fanatic underscore pick. You can find us on Facebook, Twitter, all of our social media outlets, as well as the fan sided network and finfanatic.com. And if it's not on the right side and it's not on the left side, it is on the fin side.